Hi everyone, I'm Ian Atkinson. I am the uh, VP of Business Development on the games publishing side for Ad Colony. Uh, pleasure to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Prashant. I'm the business head for VMAX. Uh, we are a monetization uh, mediation platform. Happy to be here with all of you. Hi everyone, I'm George. I'm the director of APAC for Vungle and I look after our um, Asia monetization partners. Hi, my name is Pavel. I'm a founder and CEO of um, Apogee. We built that the company, uh, the ad uh, market is unfairly built in favor of advertisers. We are trying to bring the balance back to the publishers. Okay, okay so uh, what I would also like to let you all know or what we are trying to do here is getting all the best of the guys in the industry so that you get a complete overview of how this business works and I'm sure you know all about Apodil, uh, Wungle, Ad Colony, VMAX and of course Pocket. <laughs> yeah, but uh, before we start, I think uh, the first question that I need to, you know, uh, ask you guys and get your opinion about is, uh, you know, if you could tell us what is the, uh, what are the different ad units that are available for a game developer to, you know, use efficiently and optimize it to, you know, increase their revenue. So. Um. Today, so if you look at the last 12 months or so, the different kind of ad units have gone through a large, a very huge transition. Uh, back from the days of pure display, now you have, uh, then you moved into video, rewarded videos. Uh, now it's been taken over by native, and especially for gaming guys, natives has been a great format, both in terms of customization, also in terms of native video and other formats. And rewarded and offer walls are the other ones which are pretty popular. So within these formats, we have seen anywhere about uh, you know, eight to ten different formats being done across display, native, video, and uh, dis uh, and uh, rewarded. Uh, the popular being uh, native and rewarded. So those are the ones that we're seeing pretty popular at this point of time across all markets. Okay. How about uh, you know, your input? Okay. Um, so I'd have to agree with Prashant. I think we've seen a fundamental shift in the model of advertising within apps and games. I think moving from the self-serve model where you can throw a banner or a static interstitial uh, at any point in an app or a game, I think now the ads are a lot more integrated. So we see moving to native for in-feed. We see moving to rewarded video like a Vungal or an ad colony. I think now you need to consider a lot more when you're integrating ads into your game. It's beyond just where in the game. Now it's what are you offering for watching that ad? Uh, what type of reward, how much reward, and how frequently you uh, provide that reward to your user. So the whole economy has changed. Sure. Uh, you want to just add on? Pavel, Ian? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add a few things here. So I agree that uh, rewarded video as well as natives are trending a lot lately. However, I'd like to emphasize that rewarded videos are essentially built for advertisers. They convert well, right? And they do produce high ECPM, but overall revenue that you're going to generate with rewarded videos is probably not going to be too high because of the overall volume that you're going to be delivering. So uh, on our platform, we continue to see the majority of the revenue flowing from uh, obsolete formats like interstitials and banners. And uh, one of the reasons, I would say, is uh, the majority of branding advertisers, they're, they're still spending on interstitials. So uh, I think video is going to be uh, uh, growing a lot, and it, it, it has a lot of potential for the publisher, but we need uh, to wait for the brands to come there first. As for now, I would uh, stick with interstitials and banners and uh, start playing with native ads in order to, you know, gets a better retention rate. However, um, rewarded videos can still be a good alternative to uh, in-app purchases. Uh, I think, you know, you want to add on to it? Yeah, just to, Because uh, I'm going to get into a discussion with uh, Pavel. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I somewhat disagree with that. Uh, we, we're, uh, you know, our, our platform at iColony is, is strictly video, both interstitial and rewarded. And we see the highest uh, earnings uh, with rewarded video by, by leaps and bounds over any other of the ad units. 
Um, and I think some of, and to the point about it being built for advertisers, I somewhat disagree with that as well. Uh, I think it really comes down to how you think about that ad unit as a rewarded video. The way we talk with our developers is very much a tool for you to do something for your, for your audience, whether that's retain, engage them, keep them in the session one more, you know, one more play session, extend the, the play session. So really thinking about it as a tool for the things that you want to do with your game mechanics and the things that are important in the game. And then the reward, the, the actual payment, the monetization is, is after the fact. And the folks who think about it in that regard do much better than just slapping in there as here's, a, here's an ad unit, you know, make us some money. Um, it's very much a tool that they use as part of their game mechanics. And I think those combinations is the reason why we see such high ECPMs on, on our network. Sure, and also if I can just uh, give you my insight of the speaking with a lot of developers, right? Uh, for them, one of the most important thing is to also look at their UI and UX, and somewhere or the other uh, banner and interstitial, uh, which has been one of the older ad units. But as a gamer, on a personal note, when I play games, right, I personally don't agree to the banners or interstitials that I'm thrown at, right? Obviously, I don't pay for it, so you can kill me for it, but. I still don't like the banners and interstitials. So for a developer, it's also important to think about, you know, where those banners and interstitials are placed, right? Like putting a banner on a gameplay screen is an absolute disaster, right? But I think, obviously, developers are more smarter than me. They understand that, but I still find some games which have that. And then they say they don't have retention. Come on, the banner has made the player go away, right? So. I agree to you, but I would say that, no, uh, the UI, UX is more important. I, I agree with you that UI is uh, more important. And like I said, rewarded videos do provide very high retention rate as well as native ads. Uh, however, in many cases, uh, it makes sense to sacrifice your retention rate in order to make higher revenues, especially for many uh, indie developers and, uh, you know, smaller casual games. Uh, Okay, yeah. so George is gonna, you know, jump yeah. into this now. <laughs> I think if you told developers to sacrifice their attention rate, they'd tell you to get out of the of the room, right? Um, so I think you don't have to sacrifice retention, and you can still make more revenue, right? So the the great thing about the rewarded video we see, and I'm sure Ian sees the same thing, is that it enables your audience to become more familiar with the in-app economy. So maybe. 99 or 98 percent of your users would have never bought that diamond or never bought that coin. What the rewarded video allows you to do is it allows you to try it out. Uh, you can segment your users so you only show non-paying users that video or offer them that reward. And then what we see, there have been studies done by Gree and, and others that say perhaps it might lead to more um, IP revenue, right? So I'd, I'd say be careful on the on the retention side. You don't want to don't want to mess with that. Yeah. Yeah. Adding on to the retention part, the way uh, I understand about the rewarded video business, uh, uh, personally, I don't look at rewarded video as a monetization uh, tool for a developer as much as a retention and an engagement tool. Because think about it, right? He was playing your game. He's out of his health. He just wants to quit your game, and you're telling him, okay, watch a video ad and play my game more take an extra health, stay in my game. So more of it, instead of just monetizing, it's more about, you know, you're increasing the session, you're increasing the gameplay time, and then obviously it's also helping you to make money. Okay, so uh, one of the other question which I hear a lot, and maybe I need you to help me, uh, you know, explain. A uh, lot of time, should there be a different strategy for Android, iOS? I'm gonna discount Windows for some time, but, uh, uh, Android and iOS in particular? Should there be a different strategy uh, for monetizing from an ad network point of view? I think uh, on a overall basis, if your gameplay and your UI isn't that different in both the uh, cases of Android and iOS, you may not largely need a different strategy. But yes, uh, I've seen there are more statistically and number-wise, there are more uh, in-app purchases happening in, and, uh, in iOS as compared to Android. So maybe you want to keep a different experience there only in terms of whether you're showing the user an ad in the first 10 sessions or not, uh, the the frequency of those, because there are still a chances of a, if a user is sticking in your iOS game, he may end up doing an in-app purchases. Right. So you may just be want to be a little more judicious in terms of how you are using uh, the advertising currency within the game. Okay. Beyond that, uh, I haven't heard or seen developers being or using strategically very different uh, approach to iOS and Android. 
but do you think it's important for them to uh, consider it? Yes, it is important right. if your game is someone where you know you can drive in-app purchases and obviously if in-app purchases are being driven, that's sure. the best thing. That's the best point. Take that approach and just give that user a little bit uh, different experience in terms of frequency and all. As far as Android, just go and blast away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ian, you want to add on yeah, to this? I, just, uh, I don't know if I have much to, to add. I think we, we do a lot of integration uh, recommendations with our developers where we actually play the game. Um, when we look for opportunities to, to insert ad zones or rewards that make sense. Um, and typically, there's no distinction between iOS and Android. Most of the time, it's a single conversation. The, the game, the, you know, the platforms, at least in terms of gameplay, are so similar now between the two that um, what, what recommendations we do come up with apply to both. Um, and we rarely get questions about the differentiation between the two. So I don't think it, it matters too much. I think um, maybe in the past when there was a separation in terms of um, volume and eCPMs between the two, but that, that, that gap is, has significantly closed in the last year where, you know, we're seeing sort of the same sort of metrics on both platforms. So um, I, don't, I don't think it matters as much um, uh, from a rewarded perspective. Okay, but uh, if I can just say, uh, as far as uh, whatever understanding we have, I think uh, iOS users are more uh, easy to get converted to an in-app purchase as compared to an Android user. Uh, and that is the cases. reason why, you know, you can't just bombard the uh, iOS users with advertisements. Yeah, and I, I never suggest bombarding with anyone with that. <laughs> and I go back to, to sort of how you were referring to it. Is it's really a, a tool to, to drive game mechanics versus monetization first. And when you do it in that regard, then it, it's not bombarding. It's part of the game plan. I think it, it approaches both Android and iOS equally. Sure. Uh, George, you wanted to add something on this. Um, I think differentiating between OS isn't uh, a big factor. I think a larger factor will be the geos where your or the countries where your users are based. That's going to drive your IP and your monetization decision even more so. I think um, certain geos like India, Korea, South Korea, are more um, Android based. Uh, but if you look at certain markets where the payment systems aren't set up, the credit card systems aren't set up you probably have to take a little bit more ad-heavy approach uh, than in, in more established regions. And I'd say also the genre of your game has another big impact, right? So casual games where you make less money on IEPs, clearly you need to rely on another method of monetization. Um, but more hardcore games where, you know, an RPG game in Japan might see more than 10% of users making a purchase, maybe you need to be a little bit more careful about advertising in that, in that way, in that regard. Sure. Kevin? So I, I agree with you guys. So I would just add that um, we see more and more publishers, they uh, break down their whole audience into a segment, not just by the platform, right? But many other things like how many sessions they spend within the game, how, many, how, how, how long is their average session, where these users got acquired from, what kind of device they use, and so on and so on. So typically your whales, uh, those who spend money, those who do in a purchases, they're kind of similar to a certain degree. So we see more and more publishers trying to uh, identify the segments of whales. And uh, I mean, it applies to both platforms, both iOS and Android. Uh, the reason we break it down into two platforms, because a couple of years ago, we, it was a common idea that we have more whales on iOS, but it's not the same thing with Android uh, anymore. So I would say you have to go deep, uh, deeper into analytics to, you know, uh, identify your whales. Sure. Uh, and uh, understanding from what George was saying, I think uh, for me the next uh, important thing to understand would be with so many countries, different types of players everywhere, uh, different OS that a person needs to, you know, consider a developer. You know, what is, what is the right approach? And I think one of the approach has to be mediation. And so it would be interesting to hear out all four of you to, you know, give us an idea as to, you know, how mediation works and, you know, how should a developer actually, uh, you know, plan his own strategy using a mediation tool. Maybe let VMAX and Apodil, you know, take on it and you guys can counter it if it's wrong. <laughs> so kind of you. Uh, <clears throat> my approach and my probably uh, what we have seen across the developers is that, yeah, uh, mediation in whichever form is there to stay. We haven't seen uh, any one player. I think we're far off. Uh, we've 
those times are gone by where one player or one partner can give you 100% fill or can solve all your monetization need. Sure. I think that's where uh, mediation comes in handy. Uh, what also it allows to do you to do, and which I, I think a lot of developers, game developers, don't initially start with doing is trying out multiple things. I mean, uh, while uh, the ecosystem and your friends would have done things and you want to learn from them, my uh, suggestion always has been try them out them yourselves too. There would be some format or some way or some partner which hasn't worked for another game but can work for you. So the learnings from your uh, other developer friends are useful, but you also need to try it out yourself. Uh, mediation helps you probably do that where you are able to do multiple ad formats and multiple partners. I mean, try it out with, uh, it's, I think, monetization at all point of time is an uh, apple pie game. Throw all the pies on the wall and see which one sticks. So as long as you don't figure out which one is working out for you, it could be a very different uh, f partner or a format that helps you g get. I mean, I mean, in the last few months, we have seen uh, uh, the adoption of uh, native and uh, rewarded, which has not only helped them in getting better monetization, has also improved the UX because these formats are not in the face like a banner, as you said. Sure. So, so the while these are working now, within them also you have multiple formats. Like in case of rewarded, how do you want to time it between two videos? How do you want to time it between what kind of currencies you are giving to them? What action you are getting them to do? Same in native, you have four to five formats within native to try it out. I think that's where mediation comes in and it helps you do. Uh, it's just probably a sandbox for you to try out multiple partners and take a push accordingly. Sure, and uh, I would like to hear what Pavel you say, but uh, before that, if I can address uh, Prashant. Uh, what you are saying is, is correct, but if you look at the uh, indie developers, right, uh, they don't have the time and the bandwidth to wait, try, explore, because by that time their game is anyways, uh, you know, dead in the, in the app store. So what can they do so that they don't have to do, go through this process? Because by the time they understand, you know, the user retention has gone down, the number of downloads have gone down, so, and then they figured out, okay, it's working, but then there's no player. Correctly. So, so. Um, my uh, thing is, it's not in terms of format, but when you have selected upon a format, try more and more partners on that format. I'm, I'm saying because that won't take you too much of time also to do. While there would be one or two partners that give really great fills and ECPMs and rates in your geography, you may want to try one or two more partners and see, can I uh, add few more partners here? The thing is, how do you push your fill rates much more higher with getting more and more partners added there? Obviously, your decision on format is probably done, and format may not have give you too many room to try out. Sure. So I'm, I'm sure everybody understands mediation helps you get a uh, higher fill rate, and obviously that has an impact on ECPM. Yeah. But uh, Pavel, you, you are also a mediation player. so. Um, yeah, so it's important to understand that each ad network, no matter how good it is, they have a certain strengths and certain, uh, um, you know, opposite weaknesses, right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, geographical um, location would be one of the uh, core differentiators. Like I know that Pocket, for instance, is really strong in um, Asian region. India. India. And Indian, sorry. sorry about that. Thank so. Uh, but uh, it might not make any sense to uh, uh, display your ads in the U.S., for instance, sure. right? So one of the things mediation can help you to uh, uh, resolve is to uh, come up with an optimal set of ad networks for each uh, region, because uh, we all world in we all work in the global economy today. Uh, the other thing is that each ad network uh, focuses on each tier of impressions. So some ad networks, for instance, they are well known for uh, monetizing exceptionally well uh, casino traffic, right? Well, other ad networks, they focus more like on, on uh, branding advertisers. So depending on the audience of your app, it makes sense to... Uh, distribute different segments of your audience across different ad networks. In many cases, it makes sense to distribute tier one, like iPhone 6S Plus in San Francisco downtown to one ad network, and uh, uh, tier two to some other ad networks. So the point here is that each impression is different, and we should treat, treat each impression individually. We should uh, allow all the advertisers on the market to compete for this impression, and we should and 
in, you know, in, in each case, uh, each ad network can provide different performance uh, for each impression. So that's what mediation does. It, ex it essentially connects you to all the advertisers out there sure. and it engages them into um, competition against each other to produce higher revenues for you guys, for the publishers. Do you agree? Yes, I do agree, but uh, I would let George and uh, Ian give their insights because I have a question for both of you, Prashant and uh, Pat. But George, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we saw a fundamental shift in the market probably about 18 months ago uh, with a few mediation players coming in, getting some funding, and um, being aggressive at going after publishers. I think there was a lot of pushback in the beginning from yeah. network providers such as ourselves, but us, for example, we... Um, we have a program for our official mediation providers, which we kicked off in September of last year with Mopub, AdMob, HeyZap. Um, and we work very closely with the likes of VMAX in India and Southeast Asia. So I think there's a clear advantage for developers if you want a, um, one central dashboard uh, and a little bit of ease of management. Uh, there are situations where I believe you don't need it. Um, but Take, for example, uh, a game that we've been working on for a long time, Crossy Road, um, the Android edition. In the beginning, at the end of 2014, when it first released, they worked with us and one or two other providers directly. They had their own dashboard. Then they moved to um, Fiber, where they were able to integrate several more partners. And uh, for them, more than 60% of their traffic is actually outside of the Tier 1 region, so right. US, UK, Canada, and Australia. I think that's where the value is going to be. So allowing multiple providers to compete for traffic in regions where one single provider is probably not going to be strong. I'd say conversely, um, apps that have a lot of tier one traffic, English only, um, you know, it's, there are situations where it makes sense just to work with one or two providers such as a Bungal or an ad colony who perform extremely well inside of uh, tier one regions. Ian? Yeah, I, I would just agree. I think conceptually, um, mediation makes makes sense, especially for small and, and mid-sized developers who don't necessarily have the resources to focus this on a day-to-day. -day. It's a it's a tool to, uh, you know, efficiently uh, and quickly, you know, optimize your your ad um, fill and and hopefully eCPMs. Um, so f so from that perspective, we you know it definitely makes sense. And I I think and we definitely recommend working with two or three. Uh, different ad partners besides ourselves, obviously, uh, because it, no, no one ad network can fill 100%. And the, the, geo, um, the geo problem is definitely the number one. So there's going to be ad networks that have better, better regional fill than, than others. And if you put them all together, the hope is that you're filling you know, a good 95 to 100% of your, of your inventory. I'd say the only, the only downside that we see at times is um, for us as a network, ad network, um, you know, we've got uh, a core engine that's optimizing on the back end and trying to, you know, have the best fills and the best eCPMs. And um, with mediation, there is a, a layer of technology now that now sits above uh, our technology. Um, and so there's times where it, it allows, it, you know, basically we don't optimize as well as we could because there's another black box sitting on top of it that we're trying to, to work around. And so, um, you know, it's not all the time. It's, it's, in, it's occasionally, um, but that is something that we see as a downside um, at times. But optimally, um, that's, you know, we, we, we understand the, the benefits behind, behind mediation. Yeah, I'd like to pipe in on the, the black box issue too. I think um, there are different types of mediation layers when you're deciding who to work with. Some are less transparent um, about everything, right? So you might run into some mediation layers who don't tell you how each network is performing, how each network is filling. They give you a final number at the end, right? I think that transparency and losing that um, takes away a lot of power for you as a developer. Uh, it's very important to be transparent. It's very important for you to understand who's doing well in what regions. Um, it, it'll enable you to decision on, on the performance of each provider. So I'd also like to uh, agree with what Ian said in that each individual provider is somewhat hand, handcuffed because we don't know, uh, for example, if a game of Warhead has already been shown in front of us. Typically, our algorithm will say, this, this user's already seen this ad, we're not going to show them the same ad twice. In a mediated environment, uh, a lot of times the big spenders are up at the top, the machine zones, the supercells, 
there could be significant ad fatigue because each network will show the same ad because that's their own best performing ad, right? So you, you can run into things like this and there are certainly downfalls with uh, mediation as well. Okay, uh, so the question that I had for uh, uh, Pavel and uh, you know, Prashant, I'm so sorry, I'm used to calling you PD, so okay. So uh, what happens when a developer says that, you know, I can create my own waterfall, right? And I can select which network that I want to, you know, use it in my game. Why should I use mediation? So how do you handle that particular thing? Because almost every developer out here understands that it's all about rating the, uh, the network and, you know, playing with them, which they can do it themselves. So why use a mediation? Uh, very justified. I mean, for a developer who's coded the game and he's a techie, he, w he would want to take up that challenge. But the question is, why do you want to reinvent the wheel? Uh, if somebody's done it, um, your core strength is making a game. I would, why would you not put your resources and time in making a better and, uh, you know, more games? Whereas our core strength is in under making a mediation platform. A platform probably sits on top of thousands of games uh, and other apps. And we are learning it every day with as as both Ian and George says that there is so much of data that is going everywhere. Right. We probably are learning and there's more machine learning happening at a mediation partner's end, which could benefit a developer far more better than uh, going by and doing your own uh, mediation. As you earlier mentioned that a developer would not have so much of time to go about and uh, spend it in learning. Why, whereas get in, getting into it, making your own waterfall, I mean, you would have to put some more resource and time and more data uh, get a data analyst to work on it, whereas somebody is doing it as their co So but that... A, sorry, but uh, is there a transparency for a developer to understand what kind of revenue that a mediation company takes so that they don't get into that kind of uh, business? Yes. Uh, fair point and uh, very valid. Uh, so where, uh, rather than commenting on others, our mediation platform gives a complete transparency. In fact, we don't even route the money through us. The money directly comes to the developer. So that's... Transparency bit is something that a developer is very, uh, you know, uh, anal about and where we are also sharing it with them. Yeah, what probably would they would not understand is how the prioritization or the distribution is working because there may be a lot of machine learning which is happening. Right. But yes, at the end of the day, you get to see your numbers and you get to see everything in a complete transparent way. As long as you get that, as long as you're satisfied with the data you're looking at and there's a logic to it, I think you should go with a mediation player rather than building uh, something of your own. Right. Yeah. Okay. Pavel, uh, you want to add on to this? So uh, I agree with all of the, of the above. Uh, it's very important. Uh, in many cases, uh, machine learning uh, might be a... Uh, uh, might come up with results that might seem inefficient, but uh, in most cases it is efficient, even, even though it, it, it might seem the opposite. Uh, uh, I agree that, that transparency is very important, so whenever you uh, choose mediation platform, make sure that you understand uh, what commissions they take, what ad networks perform, which ad networks do not perform. Um, in addition to that, I would uh, point out that it is very important for many publishers to have an opportunity to play with your waterfall. Machine learning is efficient. I agree with you, but in many cases, publishers want to have this you know, control over first fill, or they have to have a direct deal with one of the ad networks and um, assign a custom place in the waterfall. Uh, I would also like to point out that uh, at Apogee we consider the waterfall model obsolete, uh, out of date, and not very efficient nowadays. Right. Uh, in our case, we rely on so-called uh, flat waterfall model, where each uh, ad network participates, uh, can efficiently compete for each impression at each tier, whether it's a first look or it's a backfill. So that's another thing. And this whole technology, uh, and get, getting back to your question, right? So it typically takes a lot of time and human resources to uh, uh, come up with something like this in-house. So since most of the mediation platforms currently do not charge any commissions and they, char they make money primarily by selling to direct advertisers, it simply doesn't make any sense uh, for the publisher to work on a similar platform in-house. So it's going to take uh, too long time, and it's simply not going to be that efficient. Okay. Uh, so uh, 
one of the thing that when I look at all the developers and I meet up with them and look at their org chart, uh, you know, I always find a monetization manager profile not existent in their org chart. And I'm not talking about the big guys because obviously they, they are at a level where they can think about all of those things. But uh, typically I'm talking about the developers that I meet in India and Southeast Asia. So what, what do you guys think about that profile, right? Because a monetization manager, you know, and you can call it anyone, but the idea to understand is uh, the CEO or founder might be a developer, might be an artist, right? Not necessarily might be a businessman in particular, right? So do you think that a gaming company should have a specific role of a monetization manager? Uh, because like, just to let you know, two profiles that I see missing in a lot of companies, one is obviously monetization manager, uh, second is data scientist, right? Uh, I don't think a lot of people even understand the importance of data scientists. So, you know, it would be nice if you guys could tell how both of this profile actually increases the revenue. And Clash Royale, right, I think is one of the classic example how data helped them monetize. Not through ads, but it still helped. So what do you think? You know, in the org chart, do you think these two are very important profiles? Well, absolutely. I mean, I've been I've been pushing for this since my days at THQ, which was about eight eight years ago. I think um, you do all this development work, and then you, the two most important parts of your business, besides you know running the business and making money off of it, are are being unmanned. And so that goes for both you know the the game economy and looking at your store and thinking about it as Amazon would think about it. You know, it's e-commerce. How do I merchandise items? How do I sell items? Um, how do I put items on sale or bundle items? I don't think developers are thinking enough about the in-app purchases once they're in the store that's pretty much set it, forget it, here's an icon, here's some description, and they should sell themselves. Well, that's, nothing sells that way. So that's one aspect. And then sure. the other is how do I manage the ad networks and how do I make sure that I'm optimizing ad zones or I'm thinking about what's the best reward, um, sometimes to drive the video, but also to drive in-app purchases. So I think it's a, it's a critical function that, um, that needs to evolve into a real position that is sort of standard in, in free-to-play. Yeah, so, so what you're saying is the way you have an artist and a programmer, there should be a data scientist and a monetization Oh, absolutely, manager. absolutely. Sure. I think it's, it's, you know, you've set the business up and then you're not having someone to, to, to manage it and make sure that it's, it's optimized, whereas the other parts of your business are. So it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a spot where um, there's room for, for growth and it's also room where you can actually maximize your revenue. Um, you only convert, you know, the, everyone knows the, the percentages, it's like one to three percent of your, your audience actually converts. Well, that's because nobody's looking after it and trying to, con you know, change those numbers. They're trying to do it through tools and through other means rather than looking at the game and thinking about how they can do it better in game. Sure. So the hard truth is uh, developers are uh, creative people, they're artist peoples, and the fact is they don't like us. They don't sure, like sure. any of the I ad network guys. Agree. Uh, it goes by showing the attendance in all our panels across the world. Uh, we never have a full house. Uh, everybody skips the monetization bit saying, what else can they add to me? Uh, the challenge there is uh, most of the uh, developers, guys, they'll go about making a game and they want in-app purchases. Yes, that's the best revenue to have. And it, after the game is done, they start thinking about monetization. Yes. The function is not there on your drawing board. If it's not there on drawing board, you don't see the need of a person in the room. The day you start, while designing a game at a drawing board level, you're saying that, okay, I want a game like this. This is how the purchase is going to happen, and this is how I'm going to monetize. Because the fact of the matter, at least in our part of the world, more than 90-95% uh, users are never going to do in-app purchases. I mean, sure, it will change, but I still don't see uh, more than 90% guys never buying. So. Get, get nearer to 100. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm playing safe. But yeah, so if they had to, if, a large number of your audience is dependent on interaction with advertising, probably you need to start thinking about that at the conception level. And once you start thinking then, that's when you put in the importance of data. I mean, the data understanding will clearly come from the monetization bid. Sure. So, and that's when you probably need that person in the room, in the org, org. And most of the developers that I've seen, either there are two people, five people, 10 people. Unless they don't cross 20, they don't look at monetization as a serious need. But Leave if they don't uh, get monetization, <laughs> they'll never reach to 20, right? They'll be yeah. shutting down the yeah, shop, right? right? So. For ad networks, we are guys like we're trying to woo this girl all our lives, and it's never happened. So 
uh, we want you to start looking at uh, at as a serious part of your revenues and sure. that's when you need I'm, I'm i'm sure for a five people company maybe you don't need an advertising guy but the moment your your traffic your revenues go higher you need somebody to manage it and once you have a person dedicatedly managing it probably that person will be doing adding much more value in terms of not only revenues but your your user experience also and your growth also sure uh, george sure um, yeah i agree with ian and and prashant on this i think my answer will be a little bit shorter i I'd, I'd say that uh, it depends on the the size of the company uh, that you have. Uh, if we go to Australia, there are a lot of two-man shops. If you go to Southeast Asia, India, there are a lot of two to five-man shops you talked about. I think if you don't have multiple titles that you're managing, you probably don't need a full-time person on advertising. Um, I think you need a full-time person to look at your in-app economy. That's what's going to make you survive, pay back your investors, and create a game that has good retention. So I think focusing on the in-app economy first is key. The advertising, it's, it's easy. It's a, it's a swift integration. Uh, as long as you have the rewards in your game built out, building in a rewarded video implementation should take you less than a day or a couple days for a good developer. So I think focus on your IAPs, focus on your retention. Um, if you're not a game that can afford to pay for user acquisition, you then also saved yourself a headcount. So um, I'd say focus on IAPs first, and uh, uh, everything will follow. That's, that's my um, I agree with you. Um, I would just uh, uh, point out that in many cases it would make sense to hire an advertising guy as soon as you are ready to approach advertisers directly. And by advertisers, I mean uh, brands. So whenever you have enough volume and you have enough concentration of this volume in a certain region uh, or in a certain vertical, then uh, it really makes sense for the most publishers to approach uh, local car dealership or some banking or you know guys like that brands because in many cases uh, they pay much 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 better than CPI advertisers and in addition you don't have to share with ad networks because you can work directly with uh, uh, advertisers so this is something we find um, advertising guys very useful uh, to have in-house. Aside from that, I would say that technology, um, like ad tech technology today, is uh, pretty efficient to uh, let it go completely autopilot, and you don't need a, uh, a separate employee to manage it. Sure. So uh, I think I, I was just looking at the watch because I think there are a lot of people around. Uh, before I ask a couple of more questions, uh, is there anything that the audience would like to, you know, uh, ask the panelists? Anyone who wants to ask, how do I make money? These guys pay a lot of money, by the way. Oh, OK, this guy. OK, I'm sorry. Let me include myself also into it. Uh, Hi, um, thank you for your talk. So as an app developer, is there any um, specific checklist that we have to consider? Um, what are the mediation tools that we have to use? Because there's a lot of them. It's quite confusing. And, and is there any checklist that we have to follow? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, so you you asking very specifically on the mediation part, or you asking for ad networks? Um, on the mediation part. Okay, so Pavel and Prashant. I guess uh, mostly on the mediation side, uh, your checklist should be three point. First is how difficult or easy it is to integrate them. Uh, secondly, how easy it is for you to understand your revenues and numbers. And lastly, uh, are they giving you that number of growth and partners that you basically need? If these three pointers are answered, I think the rest of the technology is not that difficult or different. Uh, you just need to understand from your point of view, are they adding value to you rather than you going ahead and doing it yourself? So if, if the, the, any of the mediation platform is solving that for you, I think uh, you're on track. Um, transparency is very important. It's one of the crucial uh, things here, I would say. Uh, before going with any mediation platform, make sure that you understand how, how they manage your traffic, but how their algorithms work, and if you have any control over these algorithms, if you can override it. Um, aside from that, I would point out um, SDK stability, because um, in many cases you end up with unstable SDK, unfortunately. So. Um, because of building all these adapters and integrating them might be a, uh, 
not a piece of cake in many cases. Uh, yeah, and I would say overall coverage uh, across um, um, ad sources would be very valuable as well because uh, you want to make sure that your mediation provider supports all major ad formats, which are banners, interstitials, video interstitials, rewarded videos, as well as natives. And, uh, and transparency, I would say, is very important. I just add that uh, during the selection process, it, it makes sense to talk to developer friends who have gone through the process before, um, find out you know what they what they they like didn't like why they ultimately made the decision. If there are specific ad networks that you're already interested in working with, ask them you know who who they recommend. Um, I think it's just it, it's helpful just to get an industry's perspective as well. Right, but uh, I would still say it's it's interesting to ask your friends, but please, what worked for him? doesn't mean will work for you. So you have to still take your own call. Uh, we are working on a very um, emerging industry. Everything is uh, months on years uh, in, on short spam. We have different strategies and different ways of how to attach, <clears throat> retain people, retain users, players to our uh, developers, to our uh, games. So, so how do you see the future in the next two or three years? How is the monetization going to be? The mediati me mediatization? Do you think it's going to continue this way? Do you think that there are going to be uh, other ways to present to the, to the final user? Pavel, I think you've always been last to answer. Maybe why don't you take this? Okay. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer it. Uh, uh, so, first of all, I would point out that we're going to see a, um, a lot of um, changes in ad formats that we use because current ad formats that, uh, that we currently have on the market, they either have a very negative impact on your retention rates or they're, sim uh, they're simply very hard to scale. So, uh, I'm talking about natives here. We will obviously uh, see much more uh, native ads in future. And uh, to a certain degree, gaming industry is lagging behind a little bit because uh, if you take social apps or utility apps or right. take Cheetah Mobile, for instance, they have uh, adopted uh, native ads a long time ago and they are doing pretty well. So I definitely see a future in uh, the natives. Aside from that, um, I would uh, say that uh, data science would, uh, will continue to evolve and will, become to, will continue to become more affordable and understandable. What it means for the publishers, it means that they will get um, simple tools and more affordable tools to identify their whales, users that pay better and uh, essentially acquire users that will uh, produce higher revenues. Yeah, um, I agree with ad formats, although I don't think that's going to be the most fundamental change. I think you see playable ads, native ads, these, these, they're popping up frequently. I think the biggest change is going to come on the other side, on the advertising side. So there's a lot more emphasis on performance marketing and metrics-driven marketing, things like ROAS, return on ad spend. That's only going to make it better for you as a developer uh, you're going to see higher eCPMs. You're going to see uh, much more targeted ads inside of your games. And then brand spend. So I've seen brand spend increase dramatically over the last even two years since working at Vungel. Um, and I think it's, it's going to get even more pervasive. Uh, I think more and more brands are going to be advertising inside of games once they're able to do city targeting and once they're able to target device IDs and do much more... Um, detailed targeting towards an audience, uh, I think it's only going to see, uh, it's only going to be good for you as a developer. I think the ECPMs are going to increase and your players are going to see much more targeted ads that are much more conducive to your experience. Right. Uh, just to add on to it, you know, I agree with you about the brands because as a company, you know, we only do brands and, you know, we've been doing quite good in the last 18 months and we see a lot of growth opportunities that, uh, you know, is going to come in the next couple of years. So. Like, yeah, along with performance, brands are the ones who are going to change uh, a lot of revenue for you guys. Uh, so uh, I think before we end, I would like, uh, you know, once again, Pavel, I'll start with you. I'm so sorry. 
it's always been from this side. But before we end, is what is that one advice that you would like to, you know, uh, offer to the audience uh, as to like, how should they become a millionaire, right? A-B test. A-B testing. A-B testing all the time. That's, I only got one advice to share. Yeah. Uh, George, did you take that answer from you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, I have two pieces of advice. I think one is understand your audience. Um, know for which game genre you're building, for which geography of user you're, you're building for. That's going to change your approach in terms of IP strategy and monetization. The second one will be integrate early. Uh, if you're going to put in ads, don't wait until a week, two weeks, three weeks after you release. Oftentimes, uh, your, your doomsday comment earlier about uh, you know games dying pretty quickly, I think you want to take advantage of the fact that a lot of your user base, the majority of your user base, if it's a very casual game, is going to come within the first few weeks. So um, don't wait. Yeah, so what you're saying is integrate uh, the advertising. Don't switch it on if you don't want to. But whenever you want, you can switch it on. So you don't have to update the app of the game. Uh, is yeah. that what you're saying? Well, with uh, how it relates to rewarded video, you want the users to be familiar with the reward and it to be integrated into the um, game economy early on. Right, so if you integrate it late, it's, uh, it's not going to be as conducive to your existing economy. So the basically D1, D7, D30, that's the approach that uh, they need to keep in mind. Yeah. What's on D1 is never on D30, right? So, sure, sure. So I say lose them? D0 integration, that's, that's the key, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the featured apps on the App Store now, um, you know, rewarded video is part of their product when they're building it out, right? right so right. how do you integrate it? Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a trend that you'll see if you look at featured apps. The number one, the tier one studios, Zenga, EA, they all use rewarded video. So it's got to be part of your product line. Right. I'll rather say that it's D minus six months. Uh, you minimum, most of the games take at least six months of designing and thinking and working on it. Right. Uh, at the drawing board level, at the thing, thought level only, you should think of advertising and monetization. Because the fact is, that's how you are going to pay your bill to a large extent till the time your game goes into that. So think of monetization at that level. And second thing, try out a couple of more things. Try more than one partner, try more than one format. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, I think George uh, covered the, the two, but I would, I would also add, um, you know, tie, tie the rewarded video to your game metrics. So think about the things that you want to achieve, whether it's uh, session, you know, increased session time, or if it's level drop-offs, there's ways that you can think strategically about um, those ad units or those ad zones and how they can help improve those uh, those metrics. And I think that'll go a long way to helping both the game as well as the uh, the conversion on your rewarded video. Can I also give one advice? Sure. <laughs> so uh, no, no, no. My only thing that I uh, would want to say is that. Please understand, uh, advertising uh, is very important for you to pay your bills, right? We all want you to make money from in-app purchase, right? Because that's where the bills and that's where the big money comes in. But please understand, 97% people don't buy your items. And you're not making money out of them is something that bothers me as a businessman, right? I'm not a creative guy. I don't understand UI, UX. I understand money. And I think it's very important for us to pay the bills so it's important to have advertising as a factor. Don't, maybe if you're not confident, use it in the future, but please, please use advertising as one of the monetization strategies. One of the, not the only one. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for your insights, and uh, I hope all the best for the conference, and get, please make money for all of us. Yeah. Thank you.